with Director John Martin and Kelly Mosley Miller, Assistant Deputy Director for the Office of Provider Standards and Review. I'm Mary Jo Mays Woodburn, and I work with training and curriculum for the department, and I'll be your host today. Thank you so much for joining us for lunch. I hope it's sunny where you are. Uh, just in case it's not, do me a favor and uh, imagine that you are at a beautiful outdoor cafe and that the sun is bright and shiny and the breeze is gently blowing. You've ordered something delightful and now you're sitting down to have lunch and sparkling conversation with uh, the two individuals who are joining me. <clears throat> and I'll start by introducing them. First, Director Martin, uh, if you would, just tell us a little bit about um, your background in this area and give people sort of a, um, a, a sense of um, how, you, uh, how you entered this field and, and, and where you've come from. Okay, well, hey, uh, it's nice to, I was going to say nice to see everybody, but we can't see you, and I don't think you can see us, which is probably good, uh, because we are not sitting in a nice cafe with sun shining down, but rather a room with no windows. Uh, so, <laughs> you ruined the illusion. <laughs> anyway, so uh, welcome. Um, I, I started in this field, as I think some of you know, as a uh, special ed uh, teacher in northern Indiana. And then after doing that for a few years, my wife and I were living house parents in a group home uh, for folks with uh, dual diagnosis who were moving out of an institution in Pennsylvania called Pennhurst. And uh, then spent a short period of time uh, working in a small residential facility for medically fragile children and I held the distinction of being the only male staff uh, working on night shift uh, in that for a couple of years while I was going to graduate school. And then ever since then, uh, for uh, about 25 years or so, I was in the residential business, uh, primarily running um, various kinds of residential services for folks with disabilities, uh, and then later on some vocational services, family support, uh, up in the Toledo area. And Kelly, um, tell everyone a little bit about yourself as well for those who are listening who may not have met you. I would like to say that there is no lunch here. <laughs> not only do we not have a window, we have no beautiful lunch that Mary Jo speaks of. So I'm sure she'll never ask us to do this again. So I apologize. Um, I, I started, my background in the field is when I was in college in um, in Upper Michigan, I, I worked for a group home <clears throat> for eight individuals that had been um, had just come out of an institution in the 80s. And then when I graduated from college, I started um, working for county board in Ohio and have worked at the department um, for the last 18 years. So that's, that's my background. And I believe you started when you were about 10 years old. Exactly, so, right. Correct. Yeah, I was the youngest ever to be hired. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both. I think you both bring a really interesting perspective because of your wide um, background and, and uh, all the different lenses that you see these issues through. So uh, as we start today's Brown Bag Thursday, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. First, Brown Bag Thursdays uh, is a new series of webinars that will focus on topics that are important to Ohio's SSAs. Um, this comes from the SSA in-person rule training and a request for additional training on topics around person-centered planning and around tools that uh, SSAs find useful and things that we, information that the department can share with its stakeholders. Uh, these webinars will take place the last Thursday of every month. And the next webinar, May 29th, will be around conversational assessment uh, with some guest speakers who are putting these practices uh, into action in the field from Clark, Licking, and Cuyahoga counties. So looking forward to those, uh, to those future topics as well. Also, uh, this webinar may be a little bit different than uh, of webinars that you've attended in the past. Uh, while it is true there is no lunch or windows, um, there is a, an interview format that we'll undertake today 
that will be a little more question and answer. So you won't see quite as much text on this screen. Um, some slides will have very little text. Don't worry, it's not your, your screen. Uh, your, your screen is refreshing just fine. Um, but there will be tools and live links on most of the slides that you'll see in front of you. None of these tools, of course, are mandated by DODD. These are just tools that we have found of interest that you might find of interest as well. Some scholarly articles and some additional information about person-centered planning. We will take questions at the end, although if you have a question as we're speaking, if we've sort of uh, lost you completely and you really need us to clarify, feel free to type that in your chat box. Uh, there will be a recorded version of this webinar on the DODD website and also on the Ohio SSA workspace. Just a note here, if you're not familiar with the Ohio SSA workspace, this tool is created again out of the in-person trainings and used to house tools um, that SSA has identified as being useful to them and they were willing to share with other counties. It's been a great workspace to present things from the department and also from your colleagues in the field. There's also an easy print version of PDF of this PowerPoint if you are a note taker or a doodler, as I tend to be when I listen to webinars. It really helps me to focus. Um, and that link is live there as well. Continuing professional development units are available for viewing the live version of today's webinar. One credit hour is available in the areas that you see on your screen, adult services, day of invitation, investigative agent, service and ports administration, superintendent, and county board members. Um, the good news is, is that these will be really easy to access. I will shoot an email to those that have registered for this webinar. Some of you who might be sitting in a group, maybe only one person in the group have registered for the webinar, you can uh, have your supervisor send me a short confirmation just to state that you did take part in the webinar, and um, I will send you that certificate as well. So I will follow up with you by email if you have registered for the webinar and get that approval code to you. And if you have not registered for the webinar, an email from your supervisor or a supervisor, if you can put a list of names of people who attended in that email, that's fine as well. <clears throat> for those of you who are viewing this webinar in its recorded format, I apologize, but units are not available for the recorded webinar, um, although we do hope to be able to include that in the future. And now we'll jump into our topic, um, our approach to person-centered planning from the department. And I want to direct a question to the director. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on person-centered planning on a federal level. Um, and I'm fairly new to uh, this field and am not familiar with uh, the approach to person-centered planning from the DD field. Is it a shift in perspective for the DD field to focus on person-centered planning? Well, I think in a lot of different parts of the state, folks have been involved with and work, working on person-centered planning for years. And a lot of you out there have probably listened to presentations by Derek Dufresne or Michael Small or Mary Lou Boren, uh, just to name a few over the years who've been involved here in Ohio. So there has been, I would say, a lot of effort in terms of best practice in this area for a number of years. The difference is that now with the new CMS regulation, <clears throat> it becomes not a matter of best practice, but an actual requirement. And so we have this uh, requirement out there that all waiver services uh, have to be, have to involve person-centered planning. And so what you're starting to see happen is that we will be evolving our rules. The new SSA rule is a good example of that. The behavior support rule is an example of that but that we will be evolving our rules to uh, fit in with this new federal mandate. You mentioned a couple of names that align with uh, some different schools of thought around person-centered planning, and there are, in fact, uh, several, I, several various ideas about person-centered planning um, and uh, several different ways and, uh, and practices. I'm wondering for our department, is there um, an approach that the department subscribes to specifically? Um, I, I would say the answer to that is is no. And again, I noted a number of you have, have probably out there used uh, different consultants in this area and even have folks in your own staff who do training in this area. And I think one of the beauties of Ohio is that we 
historically haven't really taken cookie cutter approaches and uh, that things have evolved a little different in various places depending upon perhaps the consultant being used or you know the particular flavor of, of a particular community so we don't subscribe to one particular methodology but rather you know we'll be directing uh, to basic principles as well as following the federal regs in terms of that yeah I think the beauty of the of the CMS regulation is that it'll, it, it, it not only it mandates us, but it, it mandates us to get back to what what we like to do, and um, and I think that is a we're in a great position. Um, we're now the feds that we've sort of <clears throat> maybe in the past believed they wanted us um, to to do a lot of things that were very time consuming, paperwork related, um, compliance related, that now that you know the things that are in their um, regulations are, are the, is the work that I think we all enjoy doing so and I want to um, point out some of the key elements that um, talked about being a part of person-centered planning here at the department in um, the conversations and meetings that uh, I've been involved with and then sort of explore each of these individually um, but the key elements that um, I've listed here are comprehensive understanding of the person, empowering informed choices involving trusted support, enhancing natural support, and of course plans and services being driven by the person. So let's talk first about a comprehensive understanding of the person. Um, it seems when you say person-centered planning like that would be common sense. You'd really have to have a a comprehensive understanding of the person in order to be able to to put together a solid plan but I'm wondering Kelly it, it also seems like it would take a lot of time and, and be pretty difficult to understand a person um, to that extent to be able to really put together a solid plan what are some tools that people can use to build that comprehensive understanding yeah I, I think the key is, is are the people that that know the individual the best so we haven't always, um, you know, we have a lot of professionals sometimes sitting around the table who maybe has known an individual or just done an assessment on an individual, but we, we have, I think, historically maybe left some people out that really know the individual best. So I think our new SSA rule helps with the, this message, which is the SSA may not be the person who knows the individual the best, and that really is okay. Um, that they don't spend the most time with, with the individual, but that their job is to identify the people who do know the individuals best. So in many situations, that's family members, um, you know, or neighbors. Um, in, in, in situations where individuals have lived away from their family, the people who generally know the individuals best are the direct care staff. And those are not always the people that we ask the most questions to. So. I don't think there's a one answer, um, but I but I really believe that it's about getting the understanding who has been important to the person, who knows about their history, who understands what maybe their medical needs have been in the past, who sort of um, has a trusting relationship with a person that understands what their um, financial um, you know needs are or what they have. Um, available to them, where, where is it that individuals like living the best. Um, so I think that initially it's about making sure the right people are part of the discussion around the, with the individual. And when you say um, making sure the right people are involved in that discussion, what kinds of uh, areas of discussion? So you mentioned financial and you mentioned medical history and maybe family history. Can right. you elaborate so, a little bit so more? Housing, what, you know, housing needs, um, you know, do, are, do individuals generally like living by themselves or are they more comfortable with, you know, roommates? You know, what are their, um, you know, what, what kind of um, resources do they have available? Um, you know, how, how, how and do they communicate and then who do they enjoy being around? What do they like doing, doing during the day? Are they interested in, in employment? Have they been given opportunities um, to be in the community? What are those kinds of things? So I think those are the areas that we're talking about. 
And then looking at the next uh, sort of key element of person-centered planning, we're looking at empowering informed choices um, and really getting to know the individual, having that comprehensive understanding, um, I think you know, feeds beautifully into empowering these informed choices, better understanding of the person, allowing for uh, better choices. Um, Director, can you talk a little bit about what you see as the importance of empowering people to make those choices? Well, from, from my perspective, and hopefully many of yours as well, I mean, one of the key elements of uh, being human is the ability to choose. And when we start taking away people's choices, we dehumanize them. And examples, and you could think of, you know, the more extreme examples, prison is an example of that. Slavery was an example of that. You could think in certain countries where they have class systems. So again, the more we take away people's choices, the less human uh, we, we make them. And so when you think about that, then, in terms of, of our field as well, um, for everybody that we serve, and as you know, we serve a, a wide variety of folks in our system, but for us to, um, to view them as equals and to view them as fellow humans means that we need to ensure that they are making, in choi they are making choices uh, over their lives and, and what is important to them. So it is both that part of choice, you know, being human, and then that other part of it as well is, is kind of having a purpose in your life. I mean, what is your purpose? What, what is it that's important to you? Um, and how can you make choices to, to move you toward that? And I think you really hit on something key there with uh, in discussing having purpose revolving around choice. Um, the more opportunities you have for choices, the better you get at choosing, and the clearer you can sort of define your purpose to yourself. Right, and that means that for those of us who work in this field, no matter where we, we work in it, um, for us to support individuals in making choice, we really can't do that, or we certainly can't do a very good job with that, unless we have a relationship with the individual, and through that relationship helps us understand what is important to them. And I think, you know, I mentioned before, you know, we serve such a wide variety of folks, and I'm sure all of you work with people who you're with them five minutes, and they're very verbal, and it's real clear to you what's important to them and, and what it is they want. Then we also serve folks who are nonverbal, and they are not able to express themselves. So the only way that we're able to kind of get at that is, is really through observation, spending time with them, observing, seeing what makes them happy, what makes them sad. And it is through those kinds of relationship where there's, there's kind of no way you can get around it other than spending time with the individual. But it's, it's through that, I think, that we can get a sense of what's important so that as we help them make choices or try to understand what choice they're making, we can then, we can then support that. And if you think about your own life, you know, all of us have to make decisions, and most of us have people, you know, we, we don't just make choices for our own life in isolation, but we also make it, often make it, if we have a, a spouse, a significant other, a partner, kids, parents, whatever, uh, friends, drinking buddies, whatever it is, that often we bounce ideas off people to help us make better decisions. But we don't do it randomly with people off the street. Um, we only do it in the context, usually, of somebody that we know well and that we trust. And so it is no different from the folks that we serve in our, our service system. If, if we want to do a good job with this, um, you know, we really need to understand the folks that we're working with and have a relationship with them. Well, I definitely want to thank you for a beautiful segue into my next point uh, involving trusted support. 
I read something that you wrote previously, and you said, our best relationships focus on creating a culture of unconditional acceptance and support that encourage us toward our better selves. And I share that today because I really thought that was such a perfect way of wrapping up the sentiment. We talk about including trusted supports. You, you are really in, in you know, my own life. Those are people who have my best interest at heart. Those are people who know me and have known me for a long time. And those relationships I can really count on. But they don't sit back and judge. They do encourage. Right. And, and the other thing about it is that, um, that if it is a, a, a true relationship, um, you know, not only hopefully do they not judge, but they don't cut off that relationship when you do something that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that unconditional support mm -hmm recognizing that all of us make mistakes, all of us do things that are not always wise. I've done many, I, you know, all of us can look back and see our life littered with mistakes. Yet oftentimes in, in working with somebody with, uh, with disabilities, we don't cut them the same breaks uh, sometimes uh, that, uh, that we do with others. And we start putting conditions on our relationships with them and, and our acceptance. So that, I think, unconditional acceptance is, is a really critical underpinning of this work. And when we increase the opportunity for people to make choices, certainly we will increase the opportunity for mistakes. Um, and I think that's tough for provider relationships. Kelly, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think we struggled with that as a system. I mean, I, I, believe, I believe that people help people with disabilities in, in ways in which we don't want people to make mistakes, which um, as, a, you know, as a mother, I totally get it. I, I totally get it. Um, at some point in time, your kids generally get to say, thank you for your suggestion, right? And we'll do kind of what we want to do, which is what I did with my parents. Um, so I do think that that's one of the areas that we struggle with the most in the system. And that and that what we've tried to say, at least throughout some of the SSA training, is that it, it's not all or nothing, right? So we don't have to swing over to the other side of saying, well, people get to, now that there's person-centered planning, people can do whatever they want, right? And so they get to decide whatever they want. It's not exactly what we're saying. We're talking about helping and nurturing people and giving them opportunities to experience things than to be able to make some decisions. So. Um, you know, our life experiences are what teaches us things, are the good things. Um, some of us, you know, need the bad stuff, right? Those are the best lessons for some. And, um, and that's what I think we're, we're talking about, is giving people opportunities to experience things so that they can make better decisions for them um, and that individuals who are supporting them can sort of help remind them about, well, remember when we made this we kind of made this decision last time, and we thought it was a great idea, but then you sort of changed your mind. And our system needs to be a little more fluid about allowing people to change their mind. I mean, we all change our minds on things. We change our minds on jobs. We change our minds sometimes on relationships. And that, that's, just part of, that, that's just part of all of our lives. And that our system has not always supported that. So I think that person-centered planning or the way in which we think about um, person-centered thinking is, is really much more, it's not a scientific thing, it's what the director is saying, which is you think about what the rest of us do and that it's not a secret. You don't have to be a DD specialist to sort of understand it. In fact, I sometimes think that new staff to the system are probably much more um, experts than people who've been in the field for very long because we, we, we sometimes overcomplicate things that are just innately understood. Um, and I know that based on our regulatory experience, some of the best um, people um, that really understand it innately are young people who are in the direct care service. And so they don't, you know, they, they've not sort of learned all the things that we thought were the best way and they, they address relationships with people a little differently than we do. So I don't know if I got to your answer. I think that. so, yeah. I think that was perfect. And Another really key element of the CMS rule and the SSA rule and person-centered planning overall um, is enhancing natural support. And um, Director, I'll quote you again <laughs> to, to you. Um, I think something that you said before was 
people think that enhancing natural supports or building more natural supports into a plan is um, just a way of cutting costs, but it's so much more important than that. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of it? Yeah, so I, and kind of reflecting just quickly back on, on the new uh, CMS rule, so there's lots of talk in there about community integration, and we're seeing much more emphasis on that in, in, in terms of the rule, and somehow we as a state are going to have to figure out how we measure that people are truly integrated in the community to respond to, to the feds. But one of the key reasons for that, of, of again, wanting to really increase community contacts so that folks with disabilities have the opportunity to be interacting with folks in the community just like the rest of us do. And it is through those greater opportunities for interaction, those greater opportunities to be involved in the community, that then folks can develop relationships and form these natural supports uh, uh, that, again, will provide, you know, what we hope is non-paid friendships, non-paid peers, et cetera, because it is those natural relationships that will really enhance choice making. You know, we also have this balance in the field that we, you know, we, we have wanting to really increase opportunities for choice, et cetera, and then we also always have to worry about health and safety. But oftentimes, you know, and, and, but we, it's easy to get out of whack and focus on one or the other of those without connecting them together. And I think one of the ways to really help us is if the individual is not isolated and that 100% of their relationships are not paid staff, but you have people interacting with them from the community, and they're getting feedback from folks on what it is they're doing, et cetera, that, that those natural relationships really both increase, you know, as we say, self-determination, independence, um, and interdependence, where all of us are dependent on each other, but also helps in terms of them making informed choices. Mm -hmm. And I think what's also really interesting about natural supports, I think you mentioned that it helps to form those trusted supports, which then give the individual feedback about choices in their lives. It also means that I have people in the community who maybe expect to see me on Tuesdays at bingo, and if they don't, can sort of check up on me or know that maybe, you know, I'm not feeling well or maybe I need a call. Exactly, and I, I think in, in my old life uh, working in an agency, you know, you think of those calls your agency gets where, you know, somebody was unloading a wheelchair van and, and, and they were not as gentle and as kind as they could have been, and a neighbor sees that and, and, and says that to you. Well, again, that kind of feedback, you know, it's, it's really a natural health and safety system. Uh, that the community will provide for us while if folks are isolated 70 to 80 percent of their day, you, you don't have that natural feedback loop uh, in the system. Yeah. And I, I think when we talk about integrated into the community, we sometimes think that a community outing is integrated, right? And so right. we say a lot, in, particularly in service plans, um, you know, going out to the community. So we go out to dinner, <laughs> and people with disabilities kind of go out in the community, right? So it's, I think it's just a, a, just a shift in maybe unlearning the things that we've learned over time and, um, and think about it like anyone else's life. I also think some natural support that, that I, I believe we've seen a lot of that we, we think other people should maybe begin to think about differently is you know, we have a lot of um, new private day habs, for example, and, and quite honestly, county board day habs, where, you know, a lot of individuals are maybe interested in um, exercise. And so they're developing and, and investing a lot of money in, in developing exercise programs. And the irony is they're right down the street from the YMCA, right? So what we've kind of begun to start asking people is, so you don't have to be an expert at exercise because the why kind of is, right? And they know how to do that. And so we begin to start thinking about people maybe participating in an exercise program where everybody else participates.
participates in an exercise program. Um, and that happened to have these specialized programs where people really do stay isolated. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of exercise necessarily, but <laughs> I think that part of the um, positive thing around exercise for individuals is the social aspect of it. So I'm not exercising with people that I live with every day, and I'm surely not exercising with people that I go to work with. I don't want those people to see me in the club camp, right? So I think it's just sort of just a little shift in our thinking and um, recognizing that that natural support is way goes way beyond um, saving the system money. Of course, the next key idea that plans and services are driven by the person. And uh, with person-centered planning, this seems uh, like a sort of common sense feature. It's right there in the title. But uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what it looks like when it works really well, when you see it happening and it's and in the field and it's working really well. Kelly, can you talk about that? Well, I think actually the director did a wonderful job of sort of really talking about it. I'll I'll try to add to it. <clears throat> and so it's sort of easy when you think about some of the individuals that we are, are in our system that can um, tell us what it is that they want. I mean, um, and, and they have opportunities to pull from to begin to develop sort of what it is I want, you know, what, what are my goals. A um, little more challenging for individuals who are not um, who are not as verbal and maybe haven't had experiences to be able to, um, to, to tell us. But that's where it really, <clears throat> we rely heavily on individuals who really get to know them. And the director talked about it. It's not anything fancier than you just got to spend time with people. Um, so I, I think that, you know, and, it's, and the language is in our rule about, you know, a good, good person-centered planning is about that balance of what are the things that are really important to me, and then what are some things that are probably important for me, and that um, that you you identify those things only based on understanding where an individual has come from and and what brings them joy, what are the risks for them. Um, I don't know if that answered it, Mary Jo, or not. I think so. I think you talked a lot about um, how plans and services have to revolve around knowing the person, going Absolutely. back to that key element of comprehensive understanding of the person and how natural supports play a role in that. Um, I'd like to talk about the uh, language in the SSA rule. It's a person-centered language. It's very, um, it, I mean, it really embraces these key elements uh, in the rule. And some of the areas that uh, we discussed in in-person training, I've uh, listed here on the slide as well. Um, but let's talk about how the rule works within person-centered planning. What makes this rule such a great example of person-centered? Yeah, it's a really different rule. I mean, I think it's very different from the administrative rules we've maybe written in the past. <clears throat> and it, it's wonderful that um, the CMS guidelines came out afterwards. It was as if we were as if we were directing the Fed. <laughs> um, but, you know, the rule is real clear about the areas in which um, there needs to be um, assessment information. And it doesn't mean that you have to assess every single area, but that it really requires the team to talk about are there areas that um, we've identified that are important um, to learn some, get some information about the individual. So obviously, um, we, we think uh, the system feels that it's really important to understand um, what's important around health and welfare. So, and I think we, we probably do a really good job with that. We beef that part of our system up. I think it's the balance that we're struggling with, um, that you know, understanding that there are risks um, for an individual doesn't mean that you take all the risks off the table. It just means that you talk about what those risks are, and you begin to try to um, minimize those risks as much as possible, knowing that life kind of happens to all of us. Um, so um, health and welfare is certainly an area, um, and, and understanding what the known and likely risks are. This whole um, concept about what's important to and what's, what's important for 
is not new, but pretty new to our for our role. And um, certainly, um, Michael Small is, I think, the person who probably started talking about it a pretty long time ago. Uh, maybe a decade, a, maybe probably at least. least a decade, right? But I think we're catching up and we're figuring out what he means. And it is, again, I think the director did a great job of explaining. And it really is finding that balance that um, you identify what those things are. And then you um, begin to wrap services or support around those, um, those kinds of things. Um, community employment is obviously a, a significant push um, in, in Ohio. And we begin um, talking to people early on about what what they sort of are, are thinking about, and I believe that the director might be talking about this later. He does a better job than I am, so I'm <laughs> going to skip. I'm sure Kristen Helling is very happy that I'm going to skip that part. Um, um, but, and then, you know, monitoring is a is a, is totally different in this role. We've made it much more person centered. Um, we our system took a very um, um, cookie cutter approach, and I believe our rules certainly supported that around monitoring and that, you know, we talked about monitoring a lot as it was an activity and, um, or an, an event and not an activity. And so we've been clear, I believe, in this rule that monitoring is different for different people based on what's going on in an individual's life. So um, that, that's something that I, I believe our rule, <clears throat> the words in our rule support um, person-centered, even through the monitoring activities. Um, Again, our rule emphasizes natural support like it has has not in the past. And that, you know, the SSA is the person who coordinates the services, but that we're clear that the SSA is not always the person that knows the individual um, best. And I think we may have done a disservice to our SSAs and other um, really important team members, maybe in our past, that we expected a lot from SSAs who don't spend the majority of time with individuals. Um, I'd like to talk about the different programs that support person-centered planning, and we'll do that in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to mention some of the training opportunities around the new SSA rule that, um, that we've done recently and that currently exist. Um, there are in-person trainings uh, that took place between, I think, February and April. Right. It was a series of them yep. that you did, Kelly, with Gene Teller, a national expert on person-centered planning. Um, they were done in Columbus and a couple of other locations across the state as well um, to introduce people to um, discussions about the SSA rule. And a lot of really great feedback and conversation came from those. Um, what also came from those were um, a need a need was expressed to sort of house tools that SSAs are using in different counties across the state, and that's where the SSA workspace comes in, um, that SSA Google site that I mentioned. And again, all of the links on your screen are live links. However, if you're having trouble accessing those links, you can download a PDF version of this PowerPoint um, as well. There was a, a link for that in your confirmation for the webinar, and that PDF also contains links that uh, you may have to press control and then click your mouse on, and that should open up for you in your browser. Um, but this screen that you see before you, in fact, does have um, the, the Google site, the SSA workspace, and we've completed an online training, an interactive online training with Karen, a new SSA virtual trainer who you'll see in the bottom corner. Um, and Karen walks you through the SSA rule and um, some examples of how it fits into different key sections that we've been discussing today. In addition, then, are the monthly webinar series, uh, which we uh, kick off today. So I'd like to talk a little bit as well about uh, the programs that um, DODD offers and how they tie into person-centered planning. And I'd really like to start with Imagine, because it's a topic of great conversation in the SSA rule training, how it fit into person-centered planning, and how it will be used, uh, how it's used currently and then in the future as well. OK, well, probably started, and I, I never remember things all that accurately, but it seems like it was two or three years ago, 
where uh, Region 5, a group of 17 counties, made a commitment that they would be transforming their culture to use a person-centered planning approach. Uh, but also the project in Region 5 was actually broader than just person-centered planning, but also looking at various business practices and things that were going on in those counties and looking at um, was it possible to standardize some business practices and create some efficiencies and, and increase the ability uh, to share staff across county boundaries. And so um, uh, that was kind of the origins of the Imagine project. Uh, the department has been working with uh, Region 5 then to add uh, a suite of IT platforms to our already existing statewide IT platforms that would include uh, person-centered planning as a part of that uh, suite. And so, um, again, we've been working with them to, uh, to create it, and hopefully uh, when all is said and done, it will be you know, a comprehensive system that will incorporate a lot of our current uh, pieces that are already there that people use around the state uh, with a person-centered program plan as a part of it. And some of the questions that I heard at the SSA in-person training around Imagine um, included questions about the access to the Imagine system. Is it the intention that eventually it'll be available to people statewide? And if so, will it be mandatory for people to use statewide? Yeah, so it, it will become uh, available statewide. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at getting it up and operational. It's already starting to be used, uh, kind of piloted in Region 5, and we want to get it up and operational in, in uh, Region 5. And then, you know, we will make it available to anybody in the state who has interest in, in, in using it. But my understanding of the system is it will just be available and not a requirement for counties to use. That's correct. That's correct. And I think another piece that people were pretty excited about was that it interfaces directly with all of the existing systems. It's not a new build for people who might be using it. It inter interfaces currently with, with their current processes. That's correct. That's correct. And that was the idea behind it. Again, many people are familiar with a lot of pieces that already exist in our system, the cost projection tool, et cetera. Um, our information management system, our data warehouse, so this simply adds another component to those existing suites. And Kelly, I think at the SSA in-person trainings, there was some conversation about the Imagine tool and person-centered planning, just to really define that um, person-centered planning is not just the Imagine tool, and the Imagine tool is not just person-centered planning. The two are pretty distinct. The Imagine tool is um, interfaces with uh, our systems and is an information system that supports person-centered planning but can't be used to sort of redefine your processes as person-centered on its own. Yeah, right. And I think we, the, the more trainings we did, the better we all became familiar with um, some of the hard work that Region 5 has done and people started becoming very, very excited about it because they were much better at um, describing it than, than certainly I was. I mean, the common theme that we are hearing, um, I, didn't, I hadn't practiced this part, so <laughs> okay. So the common theme we're hearing across all settings from boards and providers is about this standardizing plans and that we have all these different kinds of plans and that it's really challenging for providers, it's, it's challenging for, that people are saying, on a real regular basis, you know, can we just have a standardized service plan? And so we've not taken that position at the department, right? That's not one of the things that we've said we're going to spend a lot of time talking about standardized plans. But I, but I believe the beauty of this tool is that it, it, it will give you the ability to dump information in, and it will look very similar from from county to county if counties choose to use it. They don't have to, it's not a huge investment, right? It's already been developed. Um, it'll are, have already been piloted. Um, yeah, and, and I think to draw a distinction, um, 
you can move toward the standardization of process Correct. while not having standardized plans. Because right. I think uh, having a standardized plan is the exact opposite of person-centered planning. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, it's about the development of an individual plan that really supports the individual's goals and, you know, what they want out of their life. And so it's important that this instrument, any instrument, have that flexibility that these plans are individualized. That doesn't mean that there aren't some standardized practices or some things um, that one would go through in the development of those individual unique plans. Well, and I think it gives you the ability to spend more time individualizing a service plan and not all the time and energy it currently takes for many um, SSAs in putting the plan together. So I agree, yeah, I need, make, I need to make sure that I say that it's not about standardizing a service plan, it really is about standardizing, this gives the ability to standardize some processes you can use your resources for the development. Right. And Director, can we talk a little bit about Employment First and how Employment First really um, incorporates those key elements that we discussed with person-centered planning? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So many of you are familiar with the, the National Core Indicators. And one of the things that we found when we did the National Core Indicators, which asked a lot of questions to individuals served in our systems or their families, um, was that there were a significant number of individuals who said they wanted a job about 50 to 60 percent who don't have one said they wanted a job, yet I think only 10 to 15 percent had looking for a job in their individual service plan. And so there is this disconnect between what we heard folks wanted and what we as a service system were actually putting in place to, uh, to serve them. And so hopefully, as if we do a good job of person-centered planning, and we listen to what the person wants, and we have an understanding of what their skills are, what their strengths are, that this person-centered planning process becomes a great tool to help us match individuals with disabilities to a job in the community that they will be happy with, that meets their skill set, and will help them be successful. So person-centered planning really is an integral part of developing a plan that helps meet, you know, what it is they'll be doing during the day, which again, we would like to see, and our data tells us from talking to individuals, they would like to see a lot more people having the opportunity to be employed in, community, in uh, integrated work settings. Um, I'll ask our listeners to go ahead and uh, type questions into the chat box that they have for Kelly and the director. And um, director, I'll ask you to talk a little bit about how programs for um, younger people like Early Intervention or the Ohio Play Project, how those uh, work with person-centered planning. And then we'll take those questions shortly. Okay, well, if you think about it, those of us uh, in our system who receive services who have a guardian, it is that guardian who often speaks on our behalf to help determine um, our person-centered plan. And this is obviously the case when you're talking about, you know, uh, early intervention, which is zero to three. And so the approach that we're using with early intervention, which many of you out there are familiar with, is instead of, of focusing on the individual child, the focus is really on the parent and giving the parent the skill to work with their son or daughter. And so the goal of that program is to create uh, confident and competent parents. And that if we can build that foundation, and if you think about it, it's those parents who are going to drive the individual education plan, they're going to be very involved in those early years at helping set the expectation for their son or daughter. And that again, it's, they're not turning them over to the professionals and say, you do what is best. But again, it's them setting those goals, driving that plan. And so we see 
the approach in early intervention as being kind of the first step as people enter our system to person-centered planning. And then as, you know, all kids grow up, um, a lot will become their own guardians. And um, we then hope the parents smoothly transition. That's sometimes a struggle for all of us uh, when our children become adults and we have to give up decision making. But that parents having been involved, that that will create a positive transition to individuals as adults to kind of pick that up themselves and or if they need their parents to continue to be their guardian, again, parents will, you know, have really over the years uh, become the expert about their son or daughter and really help design programs and plans that best support their sons and daughters. I think that's a really great way of talking about it, you know, training parents to um, use a person-centered approach as you work with them, and then they teach their children. So as they become adults, like with every other skill, parents teach their children. They teach their children to use those same skills. They'll be the, uh, the, the owner of their plan, the owner of their choices, the owner of their, of their team. That's a really valuable skill. So we'll take um, a couple of questions from our listeners now. Um, with the emphasis on getting to know individuals better, uh, there's a question that asks, I wondered if you'd recommend a particular size caseload. I think if we can talk about maybe the typical caseload and whether or not you think um, a caseload larger than maybe a typical one yeah. restricts the idea of, of person-centered planning. I think that uh, generally speaking, based on our um, regulatory reviews of county boards that generally speaking caseload sizes are typically in the mid 40s so 45 individuals I, I'm not sure that I have an opinion about whether or not that's the perfect size or the best size I think that it depends on the um, it really depends on the individual but I think it's really important to remember the conversation we had about SSAs are not, you know, we're not expecting that SSAs know everything about everybody on their caseload. That what we are, this rule does is it talks about that, you know, we used to say you were the single point of accountability. Those were our words in the rule. And we've, I think we learned over time that, that it was pretty difficult to be the single point of accountability for a lot of people that you don't always spend an, um, an enormous amount of time with, but that but that your positions now as SSAs are really finding the people who know the individuals best and that it doesn't have to be you. You don't have to know the answer to everything about a person, but that you should begin identifying the people who do know them the best and then um, establish relationships with those individuals and make sure that those individuals are directing you and giving you as good of information as they can. So I don't know if that I answered the question, but you know, I think generally um, caseload sizes are right around 45. And, and again, I, I would just reinforce what, what Kelly said, and that is the role of the SSA to, um, to be kind of a expert at listening and asking questions so that if, in, in, in making sure that you have the right people in the room developing that plan. And if you can sense that, hey, a number of these folks who work with the individual, you know, it's real clear this individual doesn't like them then you probably have the wrong people in the room. Right. But, and then looking at, you know, how you become a good interviewer, how you ask the right questions, how you get the information from these individuals who know, uh, you know, whether direct service staff or a family member, et cetera, but the person who really knows them well, um, you know, asking the right questions to get the information from them so that you feel secure as the plan is being developed. Uh, that you are honoring the individual's choices, you do have an understanding of what's important uh, uh, to them uh, to help in that plan design. Yeah, we when during this training, there were many times that people would ask questions about, you know, does the does the provider, you know, have to be at the team meeting? Sometimes the individual doesn't want the provider to be at the meeting. 
which kind of led me to say the same thing each and every time, which was if, generally speaking, a person says, I don't want John Martin to be at my meeting and he provides services to me all day or all night, it would lead me to ask a question about, well, maybe John Martin's not the right guy, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you're not comfortable um, with that. And, and so then that's a discussion you have about, you know, there are other people who can provide services to you. So again, I think we, we kind of have to undo what we, what we did for a long period of time, which is to say that the SSA doesn't have to be the expert at everything. And that really what the director said is the perfect word I wish I would have used before. And that is that you're an expert at asking the questions and listening. There was also a question about the Imagine um, program. The question was, is it computer-based and how much will it cost? It is computer-based. Um, it is all web-based. It's all housed on the web. And um, will there be a cost associated with it? Uh, people will be able to, you know, to utilize the system for free. Um, in terms of the hardware it needs to run on, again, there's a lot of systems out there now that people are already using, already have the hardware, uh, but the, the system itself will be free. And um, a couple of questions about when Imagine will be available in other counties. And as I understand it, um, there, I, I, I don't know that any of us, although you may direct your, have a specific timeline, but I think that they're still working through some processes in Region 5, is that correct? before they'll make it accessible elsewhere? That's correct. That's correct. So there's not really a, you know, a, a timetable. Uh, we've had to work on some complex security things, et cetera. Um, so I, again, there's not a timetable for making it available outside of Region 5. And we have time maybe for just one more. Um, and kind of looking through the questions to make sure that we're able to uh, get to everybody. I want to thank you all very much for your questions. Um, I think some of the questions we may not be able to answer um, today, but we'll make sure that we, re we have a record of them and then maybe get a, I don't know, fact sheet or something. I don't know what we want to call it. Because there, there, it seems to be a lot of questions about the IT side of that I don't Mm -hmm. I would really be making up a table to try to answer. <laughs> so maybe with some of those questions, we can uh, find somebody who can speak directly to those. And we'll try to, to address all of the questions that you all have sent. Um, I want to thank you all for your time this afternoon and joining us for this webinar. And uh, thank you so much to Director Martin and to Kelly Mosley Miller for um, spending time with us and talking through person-centered planning. Special thanks as well to Kim Lewis who has been um, incredibly patient and kind <laughs> in uh, helping me get this webinar together and really making everything work uh, smoothly and splendidly. Uh, thank you all so much for your time as well. Um, and perhaps you are not able to make it to a sunny cafe, but I hope your brown bag lunch is uh, just as magical. And we hope to see you again next month. Thanks. Have a great day.